so we'll start in five minutes. Oh, by 7.05, I mean. Pabutin pa natin, Romy, ng 100. Wow, the first ever, tapos 100. Yeah. 80 na, 80. <laughs> Uy, in-invite ko yung mga IM namin sa Medical City. Sabi ko, breakthrough ito. Baka nandito sila. <laughs> Check attendance mo live. Kaya, yeah, yeah. hanapin ko sila. Kasi, first dito na mapag-usapan. Kaya, exciting. Hi, Rach. Okay to eh. Okay tong akat. Hello, Lai. Hello, Aileen. Uy, oh, Jess. Oh, I mean, may libre daw galing sa papel. Put on your videos, guys. Ayan nga, para magkita Ay. naman tayo. Yes. Kaka-uwi ko lang, no? Hi. Ah, may libre daw galing sa papel. May rice mousse. May durian pie daw. Uy, paingi, B. Sabi ni Romy, sabihin mo sa kanyang sa speaker. Okay. Oy, Romy, yung Dorian ko pa. Once lang yung kuna katilawan na. <laughs> Padala sa Manila. Okay. okay. Kasi, eh. Kaya nga, balik tayo doon. Di ba? Kaya tayo ng Dorian. Yes, na. Na. I will start na. Ah, <laughs> damaya ha. Okay. Sige na, off ko na. So let's Romy, start. ha? Yes, let's start. Good evening, everybody. So... Our Heavenly Father, with humble hearts and contrite spirits, we come before Thee now in solemn prayer to give Thee thanks for the gift of healing that Thou hast placed in our hands, that through it we may restore that which was lost. We give Thee thanks for our talents, that even when we lose everything, we will always have something to share. We give thee thanks for our differences, that through them, our existence may become exciting and filled with color. We give thee thanks for our weaknesses, that through them, we may be humbled. We give thee thanks for bringing to our awareness the weaknesses of our brothers, that by knowing, we may become better friends to them. We ask thee now, dear Father, to help us use our abilities to build and strengthen one another. We ask thee to help us use our intellects, not for our own aggrandizement, but to give praise to those who are worthy of praise. We ask thee to replace our pride with an appreciating eye that we may recognize the worth of others. We ask thee to teach us how to be mindful of our calling, which is sometimes to cure, most of the time to alleviate, but always to give comfort. Lastly, help us become worthy to be called instruments of thine healing power. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Side by 
Everybody. So thank you, Mang Jo, for the prayer. And it's really nice to hear the PCCP hymn. So first of all, I would like to thank the PCCP for uh, inviting the chapter, the PCC Southern Mindanao chapter, to share our experience in hyperbaric oxygen therapy in COVID. So to start tonight's uh, lecture, uh, let us uh, hear the opening remarks from the chairwoman, chairman of the PCC, PCCP chapters, Dr. Eileen Aniseto. Dr. Eileen. Hi. Yes, good evening. Maayong gabi sa tanan. Um, welcome to the first ever chapter slash PCCP initiated CME activity. A couple of months ago, um, under Dr. Greg, I'd like to acknowledge the president of the PCCP, Dr. Greg Ocampo is here, and our chairman of the CME, Dr. Lai Garcia is also here. So it's a collaboration between the CME and the chapters that we initiate uh, CME activities and advocacy activities from the chapter mismo. And then we'll just help disseminate it so that it has a nationwide reach. So we had a discussion uh, two weeks ago, yata yon, and this one was uh, one of the most uh, interesting topics brought forth. Kaya si Dr. Lai Garcia said, yes, let's do this as the launching uh, activity for the chapter's uh, CME, uh, the presentation of the uh, Southern Mindanao uh, PCCP chapter. So uh, welcome everyone and I hope uh, this becomes a, a regular learning activity for all of our uh, colleagues in the entire country. So welcome and thank you for attending tonight's activity. So back to you Romy. Thank you Eileen. 
So I, I would also like to welcome our president, of course, uh, Dr. Greg Ocampo. And uh, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Alay Garcia as the chair of the CME committee. So also for the next part of the program, uh, will be our the president of the PCCP Southern Mindanao chapter. No other, no other than our very own Dr. Iris Batalia. Take it away, Iris. Good evening. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yes. Good evening. These are indeed trying times, and as pulmonologists, we are in the middle of this pandemic with hypoxemia as our most dreaded condition of the in our critically ill patients. After maximizing the ventilatory support, what other management options can we offer our patients? So there's the neuromuscular blocking agents, the prone positioning, and bringing it to the next level will be the ECMO and the hyperbaric oxygen treatment. In, here in Dava, we do not have an ECMO machine, but we do have a hyperbaric chamber. As you know, deep sea diving is a part of our tourism industry here in the South. And the hyperbaric chamber is intended for divers who develop the decompression sickness. So, kesa masaya nga naman yung machine, hindi siya nagagamit. So, we decided to make the most of what we have here in Davao. So, tonight's lecture is about our experience using the hyperbaric oxygen treatment in our severely ill COVID-19 patients. So, uh, welcome and thank you for your attendance tonight. Thank you, Iris. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I can. I would like to share my screen on Joe. Just a little uh, short history of hyperbaric, so that we will. I will place you. We'll be on the same page. So this is my short three slides. Okay. So the this is the history of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it has been used for the last three centuries. Okay. A British physician in 1662. Nathaniel Henshaw used a system of organ bellows and using uh, unidirectional, unidirectional valves to change the atmospheric pressure in sealed chambers called domicilium. Then in 1834, a French physician built a uh, hyperbaric chamber with pressures of 2 to 4 uh, ATA. Remember, oxygen was still not used in 1667. Oxygen was discovered in 1776 by Priestley. So the, this, this French uh, physician used compressed air bath. So ang sabi niya, uh, th there was improvement in circulation to the internal organs and brain and feeling of well-being and better health. And so there was an explosion of the different pneumatic chambers by different uh, physicians, Sitaberi, Lange, and Leibig. Uh, si Leibig niya, itong dalawa, two chambers lang sila, but Leibig used a three chamber, uh, pneumatic chambers. Then in uh, 1921, O.J. Cunningham from Lawrence, Kansas built a hyperbaric chamber, okay? He used this to treat victims of the Spanish influenza epidemic that swept North America. Then afterwards, he built a, a, even a bigger hyperbaric uh, chamber, the Steel Ball Hotel in 1928. This was the biggest hyperbaric chamber, a five-story building uh, made of high steel sphere composed of 60 rooms, wow. And then in 1930s, there was uh, this Henrik Drager, uh, remember in Drager machines, not in the ventilators. So he was the first to explore the use of pressurized oxygen in decompression sickness. And then after that, there was an explosion and every hospital in the US uh, tried to get one uh, chamber uh, use, uh, using for, use it for the decompression or the bends or Kaysen's disease. So right now, this is the, uh, the FDA approved indications for hyperbaric oxygenation, the air or gas emboliz embolism, carbon monoxide poisoning, gas gangrene, decompression sickness, enhanced healing of wounds, especially diabetic wounds, necrotizing soft tissue infections, and thermal burns and 
delayed radiation injury. So just uh, FYI to everybody. No? So ito na yung mga uh, hyperbaric chambers now in use all over the world. So without much ado, our speaker uh, is, uh, had, uh, had his medical degree, uh, completed his medical degree at BMSF, the Davao Medical School Foundation. He's a junior consultant of the Southern Philippines Medical Center, and he's a diplomat of the Philippine Board of Emergency Medicine. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Arthur Salvador. Good day to everyone. Um, first of all, we would like to uh, thank the Philippine College of Chest Physicians for allowing us to share our experience with the compassionate use of hyperbaric oxygen in COVID-19 severe illness. We are indeed humbled and um, honored to be in this forum. So the objective, uh, the objectives for this uh, um, forum would be to elucidate the role of hyperbaric uh, oxygen in COVID-19 and to share the experience of uh, SPMC in the use of hyperbaric oxygen um, in patients with severe COVID-19 pneumonia. The conception of the compassionate use of, of uh, hyperbaric oxygen in COVID-19 for severe illness was actuated by the growing number of patients incurred with the disease burden of this new pandemic. So being a noble disease, Researchers, scientists, clinicians have actually turned to all sorts of treatment modalities, both non-invasive and invasive, just to actually combat the complications brought about by the oxygen death and the vicious cycle of hyperinflammatory state. Actually, um, the UHMS defines hyperbaric oxygen therapy as an intervention in which an individual breathes near 100% uh, oxygen intermittently while inside a hyperbaric chamber that is pressurized to greater than sea level pressure. Its physiologic effects can be explained by Henry's law, which actually states that the amount of dissolved gas in solution is directly proportional to its partial pressure. Hence, when we instituted the uh, protocol using the 2.4 atmospheres for 90 minutes for five, five, uh, five to eight sessions, we actually increased the partial oxygen tension intermittently to approximately um, 10 to 12 folds, as uh, elucidated in this formula right here. By actually increasing the partial oxygen tension to this level, we not only saturate the hemoglobin with oxygen, but O2 is actually invested in the plasma, which is not possible with other oxygen delivery system. The intermittent provision of high-level partial oxygen actually leads to enhanced O2 diffusion distance up to uh, four folds. And this is also the reason why Hyperbaric is used in patients with delayed wound healing due to macrovascular and microvascular obstruction, such as in diabetic foot, um, PAOD, where perfusion to the affected area is actually compromised. Less perfusion equates to low oxygen uh, delivery, right? But in hyperbaric, even though the blood flow is partially compromised, the oxygen molecules might still reach the target tissues because, because we actually have increased the diffusion distance of these O2 molecules. This effect also takes place in the lungs at the alveolar level so that uh, um, the, the, the oxygen with high partial pressure could actually penetrate the alveolar uh, capillary interface even if that unit is enveloped by interstitial edema. This actually leads to enhanced bioavailability of oxygen uh, to the tissues and may mitigate the effects of oxygen death. Now, another physiologic effect of hyperbaric is its um, modulating effect on inflammation. The intermittent high PO2 levels actually induces the mesenchymal stem cells, which are known to have strong anti-inflammatory properties by induction of the T lymphocytes and macrophages into regulatory T lymphocytes and macrophages, which are known for inhibiting secretions of the tumor necrosis factor into leukin 1, into leukin uh, 6, and 12, and interferon. As we all know, these cytokines are one of the significant factors for the initiation of cytokine storm. And actually, these effects can be elucidated in um, patients with compartment syndrome and ischemia or perfusion injuries since the same cytokines are at play in such conditions. So considering the physiologic effects of hyperbaric, when, when we then aim to describe the efficacy and safety of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, specifically, we'll be able to describe the demographic and clinical profile of the patients. 
and we would like to also to describe the associated um, comorbid conditions and lastly to determine the average level of dyspnea scale uh, the respiratory rate the ROX index the uh, PA, uh, PF ratio O2 saturation and uh, selected biomarkers It is already established that COVID-19 pneumonia manifests as a severe hypoxemia often associated with near normal compliance of the respiratory system. Hence, uh, the type L and the type H phenotypes were actually described. And uh, as I think we all know for a fact that type L is characterized as low elastance, high compliance, low ventilation to perfusion ratio, low lung weight, and low recruitability with the hypoxemia due to vasoplegia. Now the type H, again, as we all know, type H is the typical ARDS characterized by high, elast uh, high elastance, low compliance, high right to left shunt, high lung weight, and high recruitability. So it is in this context that this study is undertaken to improve oxygen delivery using hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It is no surprise that in the previous pandemic, hyperbaric oxygen using air has been used in the Spanish pandemic and that was back in 19, uh, 1918. In the Philippines, it may not be a widely available resource in other areas. Um, thus, this study not only will elucidate the alternative cause of action for, uh, I mean, course of action for patients, but also enlightens the scientific community about the deferred use of mechanical ventilation. So, the first documented use of hyperbaric oxygen in COVID-19 was in China. It was Zong et al. Uh, this was around March 2020. He detailed the effects of hyperbaric oxygen on hypoxic patients with severe pneumonia. They actually included five RT-PCR positively confirmed patients with age ranging from 24 to 69 years old. They instituted a treatment protocol of two atmospheres for 90 minutes for five sessions. And then they observed that these patients had an immediate a, re a resolution in this in chamber and after each session. If you actually look at the graph, an improvement of oxygen saturation level can be observed after each treatment session. So they conduct, uh, they actually concluded that hyperbaric oxygen therapy can effectively correct systemic hypoxia and improve immune uh, function. So there was uh, um, another study that was done at New York Langone University by Gorenstein et al. That, uh, this was still uh, last 2020, where they actually detailed the effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy in COVID-19 patients with respiratory distress. They actually uh, had two arms in their study, the 20 HBOT uh, treated patients versus the 60 non-HBOT uh, treated propensity match control patients. So they used the same protocol, the uh, uh, two atmospheres for 90 minutes for five sessions. And then um, they found out that 18 over 20 of these hyperbaric treated patients were discharged where none of them were intubated. So two of them were intubated and died though. On the other hand, 44 over 60 patients among the propensity match uh, controls were discharged with five requiring intubation. Three were still hospitalized, two were intubated among the three and uh, they had 13 mortalities. So actually, the UHMS uh, released a position statement last August 4, uh, 2020, and they stated, th they stated there that there was actually an instantaneous alleviation of dyspnea, effective delivery of oxygen to tissues, even in bilateral pneumonia with VQ mismatch, and that pot uh, HPOT has uh, potent anti-inflammatory stimuli. It mitigated oxygen debt. Uh, it reduced um, the D-dimer levels. And they actually stated also that uh, HBOT may have a strong physiologic and biologic basis no, for COVID. So with a compassionate treatment protocol in place, we identified who were RT-PCR uh, confirmed COVID-19. We then obtained consent while they are of sound mind. And then uh, we screened for the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, after which um, the eligible patient shall be enrolled in the compassionate treatment. So as for the inclusion, we included patients who are uh, 19 to 70 years of age, positively confirmed COVID-19 by RT-PCR, oxygen saturation less than 93% at a non-rebreather mask, 15 liters per minute, with respiratory rate of greater than 30 cycles per minute at, with NRM at 15 liters per minute, and um, 
PF ratio of uh, less than 200 by Berlin uh, criteria. Uh, and of course, uh, patients who were um, hemodynamically stable with a Glasgow score of 15 and uh, patients with radiologic evidence typical of uh, COVID-19 uh, by chest x-ray. So we, we actually um, excluded patients who had uh, untreated pneumothorax, cavitary PTB, pregnant patients, COPD and acute exacerbation, um, history of seizure, um, those patients who were uh, dependent on vasopressors and inotrope, and of course the intubated patients uh, and or uh, mechanically ventilated, uh, ventilated patients. So after the screening and enrollment, the ward or ICU will coordinate with the hyperbaric unit. The IM resident would actually um, evaluate the patients before transport is carried out to ensure that the patient is relatively stable as in the inclusion criteria and can tolerate the transport procedure. This shall be communicated with the hyperbaric physician and the pulmonary consultant for approval of transport as well. So once the patient is cleared, the dedicated ambulance team for COVID with complete PPE on board, portable high flow nasal cannula and negative pressure system shall ambulate the patient to the hyperbaric unit traversing of a, uh, the, here in SPMC, um, it's about 245 meters. No more than 10 minutes transport time, of course. When the patients arrive, um, they are immediately hooked to the hyperbaric unit's O2 supply. Uh, th th we're, still, we're still talking about the um, uh, sea level uh, pressure here. Um, of course, while the team conducts the actual endorsements, be as taking as well as the uh, primary survey by the hyperbaric physicians. The hyperbaric nurse with complete PPE inside the hot zone would also conduct the, her pre-treatment and safety checklist no, before we treat all patients. So all in all, this would take no more than 15 minutes to be carried out. So um, uh, we then transfer the patient onto the gurney of the hyperbaric uh, chamber, the monoplace hyperbaric chamber, right before we close it and lock it, or uh, right before we close the seal of the chamber, we then shift the IV to HEP lock, and that is only the time that we remove the high flow nasal cannula from the patient. Immediately, the compression, uh, the compression procedure shall commence so that the ambient pressure inside the chamber reaches uh, 2.4 atmosphere as per our protocol, and the chamber, pressure, uh, the chamber pressure gauge shall be our indicator for the pressurization. The compression procedure takes about uh, roughly 8 to 15 minutes before we reach the therapeutic pressure of 2.4. And once um, the pressure has reached 2.4 atmosphere, that pressure shall be maintained for 90 minutes since that would be um, our therapeutic uh, pressure dose. So during the treatment, uh, during the treatment session, while the patient is inside the chamber, we noted that they are they were actually um, comfortable without any breathing apparatus, no, attached to them. So so much so that they would just fall asleep or yeah, you know, watch their uh, favorite movie comfortably. As you can see in the pictures here, we have two patients actually um, giving us the OK sign and the thumbs up sign for um, you know a, a approval of the treatment. So the hyperbaric nurse shall be uh, right beside the monoplace hyperbaric chamber with the patient inside. As you can see, that's, that's also in the photo. And the hyperbaric physician shall be on standby in the unit supervising the conduct of the treatment. Once the 90 minutes of therapeutic compression of 2.4 atmospheres has been completed, the patient will then be decompressed, which will take around 5 to 10 minutes on his way to the ambient pressure at sea level. So just like this, what we have here. Now the treatment protocol is um, 2.4 atmospheres uh, for 90 minutes, initially for five sessions. After the fifth session, we would evaluate these patients for um, endpoints of treatment, specifically a ROX index greater than five, a PF ratio of greater than 200, and dizziness scale of four or less. If the patient qualifies, then we would end the treatment session on the fifth session. But if there, is, but if these uh, criteria are not met, then we would recommend an additional of three more sessions to make a total of eight sessions, then re-evaluate uh, after the eighth session. 
So um, in an event that uh, the patient would um, suddenly be in distress inside the um, hyperbaric chamber, um, we do have our resuscitation protocol. No? So first, we maintain the current pressure because we, you cannot just decompress anybody out of the uh, out of the hyperbaric chamber while the patient is in distress. You have to know what the etiology is all about. Of course, the hyperbaric nurse would notify the hyperbaric physician. They would prepare the resuscitation, and once everything is ready, everything is um, uh, we're ready for orchestration, then emergency decompression upon the order of the hyperbaric physician shall commence. And then you, we can then resuscitate with the current guidelines of ACLS. So we have our e-carts uh, inside the uh, hot zone. We have our intubation sets. We have our cardiac monitor. We also have um, portable ultrasound for uh, point of care ultrasound, no, just in case the patient would um, uh, had, have some problems uh, in the chest. So uh, in an event also, of course, um, if the patient uh, gets through the treatment and uh, of course the patient will undergo the, the standard decompression procedure um, wherein the transport team is already on standby you know, at, the, at the HBOT facility and after the decompression uh, procedure, once the patient is taken out, Reassessment shall be um, done, of course, uh, by vital signs taking and endorsement of the uh, hyperbaric nurse and hyperbaric physician to the um, transport team for transport and then ambulation to the referring unit or ward. Now, this, uh, these are actually the results of our um, compassionate use. So for the demographic data, as you can see that we were able to um, accommodate uh, uh, patients who, are, who had age ranging from 39 to 45 years old, at least three patients, and that would be 23.1%. Uh, for patients with uh, age uh, ranging from 46 to 60 years old, um, th there were about uh, 70 of them, and we had some patients who were greater than uh, seven, I mean, uh, we had some patients who were greater than 60 years old, and that's about 23.1% uh, as well. Majority of our patients were male, uh, accounting for about 61.8%, and female of about 38.5%. So, um, for the comorbid uh, conditions of these patients, so Actually, we had one patient who uh, had an uh, acute kidney injury, um, more patients who had bronchial asthma, and uh, they were uh, not in acute exacerbation. We had uh, two patients who had coronary artery disease. One patient was actually diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Uh, five patients uh, who were uh, documented to have uh, diabetes uh, mellitus for uh, type, type 2 uh, controlled, DM type 2 uh, poorly controlled, we had uh, three patients, and we had two patients who had HCBD. We had 10 patients uh, who had hypertension, and um, at least three patients had co-infection, and six of these patients were actually um, obese patients. So uh, upon looking at the graph, this is actually the numerical rating scale for this. Yeah. So as you can see that um, it is showing a downward trend. No. So there, there is a decrease of um, um, negative 0.55 uh, in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Furthermore, the model revealed that 87.4% of the total variations of the uh, DISNIA scale can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. Now, the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of less than 0 0.01, and this actually suggests that the result is uh, significant and uh, conclude that there is actually a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of the uh, DISNIA scale. Now, looking at the respiratory rate, there is actually a um, decrease of one point. Uh, 172 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Actually, the model revealed that 56.7% of the total variations in the respiratory rate can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. And 
uh, by doing the comparative analysis on the pre and post uh, values of respiratory rate, in this case, the pretest mean is um, 36 plus minus 9.5, while the post-test value is um, 23.5 plus minus 5.3. And the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of, again, less than uh, 0 0.01, suggesting that the result is significant. And we can actually conclude that there is a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of the respiratory rate. So this is the uh, oxygen saturation of the patient, uh, where in fact um, this is this was taken uh, right before the patient was uh, transferred in the chamber. So uh, as you can see that there is uh, in, an increase of 1.25 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Now furthermore, the model uh, revealed that 67.1% of the total variations in the oxygen saturation can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. So, using the comparative analysis on the pre and post values of oxygen saturation, um, in this case, the pre-test mean is uh, 86.25 plus minus 8.7, while the post-test is around 97.15 uh, plus minus 2.5. So, uh, the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of less than 0 0.01, suggesting that, again, that the result is significant and conclude that there is a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of oxygen saturation. So um, this is actually uh, the ROX index of the patient. No? So there is an in actually, we note that there is an increase of 1.27 1 uh, in the ROX index parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Um, furthermore, the model revealed that 68% of the total variation in the ROX index can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. So when a uh, comparative analysis on the first hyperbaric session and on the fifth hyperbaric session, the ROX index, um, it revealed a uh, uh, pre-test mean is around 2.572 plus, ma uh, plus minus 1.18, uh, while the post-test value is around 10.97 plus 8.8. .8. And the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of um, 0 0.01, suggesting that the result, again, is significant. So this actually marks that uh, there is a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values um, uh, of the ROX index. So um, this is the... the graph uh, depicting depicting the trends of the uh, pf ratio so uh, actually we can appreciate here that there is an increase of uh, 29.4 in the pf ratio parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session and the model also reveals that 68.5 percent of the total variation in the pf ratio can be accounted for by the number of sessions done the comparative analysis on the pre and post values of pf ratio was uh, done again and in this case, the pre-test mean was 52.6, while the post-test value is 289.9 uh, plus minus 279.874. Uh, uh, so the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of 0 0.001, suggesting once again that the result is uh, significant and conclude that there is a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of the PF ratio. So this again is a graph depicting the trend for the CRP levels. As you can see that there is a decrease of uh, 0 0.98 uh, in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Furthermore, the model uh, revealed that 97.5% of the total variation in the CRP levels can be accounted for the number uh, of the sessions done. Now, um, using the comparative analysis um, with paired t-tests, we got an associated p-value of 0 0.008 suggesting that the result is significant and conclude that there is actually a statistical difference between the pre and post test values of the CRP levels. So this is uh, the graph for the LDH levels uh, showing again a decreasing trend. No, So um, actually um, you can appreciate that there is a decrease of 60.88 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Furthermore, the model revealed that 87.6% of the total variation in LDH can be accounted for by the number of sessions done as well. 
So the comparative analysis using the paired t-test got an associated p-value of less than 0 0.01, which again suggests that the result is significant. Now for the parenting levels, so um, the graph actually depicts that um, there is a decrease of uh, 78.97 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. The model also reveals that 84.9% of the total variation in the parenting levels can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. So this is the graph uh, depicting the trend for the D-dimer levels. And uh, you may appreciate an increase of 0 0.024 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. The model also reveals that 17.8% of the total variation in the D-dimer levels can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. So comparative analysis using pair t-test got an associated p-value of 0 0.465, suggesting that the result is not significant. And um, we can actually conclude that there is no statistical difference between the pre- and post-test um, values of the D-dimer levels. So this is the graph uh, actually depicting the, the trend for the fibrinogen levels. So um, there is actually a decrease of, of a 0.439 in the a parameter for every increase of hyperbaric session. Uh, furthermore, the model reveals that 91.7% um, of the total variations in the fibrinogen level can be accounted for by the um, number of hyperbaric sessions done. Now, with the comparative analysis using the paired t-test, um, we got an associated p-value of 0 0.022, suggesting that the result is significant, and we can actually conclude that there is a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of fibrinogen levels. So lastly, um, the procalcitonin levels, um, uh, there is actually a decrease of 0 0.06 in the parameter for every increase of hyperbaric sessions. And uh, the model also reveals that 77.6% of the total variations in the procalcitonin levels can be accounted for by the number of sessions done. So we again um, did a comparative analysis using the paired t-test and we got an associated p-value of 0.034, suggesting that the result is significant and um, can conclude that there is actually a statistical difference between the pre- and post-test values of procalcitonin levels. So um, in summary, um, all patients survived. Uh, none of the patients were mechanically ventilated. Um, 85 per, uh, that's 11 over 13 of patients, that's 85% had a ROX index of greater than 5 after the end of their treatment regimen. 10 out of 13 patients, that's about 77%, had a PF ratio of greater than 200 after their treatment regimen, and all of the patients had an improvement of their dyspnea based on their dyspnea scale. So we actually, we, the authors, actually recommend the other institutions to initiate compassionate use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy in COVID-19 severe illness together with the current guidelines as we are still accumulating more patients and clinical experience to arrive in a consistent and a better outcomes as we have described in this study. So this is just a, a brief documentation of uh, the patients that we've treated. As you can see that they are actually quite comfortable inside the chamber without the um, oxygen apparatus, without IV. You know, so um, we are happy for them. And uh, so on behalf of the uh, uh, Department of Emer uh, Emergency Medicine and Center for Diving Hyperbaric Medicine and Difficult Wounds, uh, Southern Philippines Medical Center, uh, I would like to thank the PCCP for actually uh, having us in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Arthur, for that uh, very informative lecture. Uh, I would also like to recognize uh, the, uh, the chair of the hyperbaric uh, medicine of SPMC, Dr. Jeffrey Ramos, but uh, let me introduce him first. So Dr. Jeffrey Ramos is a graduate of the DMSF. He had his fellowship training in hyperbaric medicine and wound care at the Herman Hospital, Houston, Texas. He had their certified uh, hyperbaric technology 
uh, the Hyperbaric Health Sydney Mascot Australia, and he's a medical specialist specialist at the SPMC. So Dr. Jeffrey, and uh, one more, one more, sorry. Huh? And then uh, also the chairman of uh, see, Dr. Benedict Valdez is the chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, he's a graduate of the Duffer Medical School Foundation. He's a diplomat of the Philippine Board of Surgery, fellow of the Philippine Society for the Surgery of Trauma. Uh, his master's in public administration, um, Philippine College of Surgeons, fellow of Philippine Society of General Surgeons. And then uh, let's welcome first uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Ramos. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oe, for the introduction. I won't take too much time talking since uh, we will be having a lot of questions in a while. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for um, giving us the chance to uh, present our uh, outcome, a COVID-19 and hyperbaric therapy outcome to the experts, the lung experts of the Philippines were very, very uh, glad that um, we will be uh, uh, listening to this uh, um, uh, landmark study of uh, SPMC, I would say. Although it's been being done in other countries, but this is the first in the Philippines, uh, as far as I know. Um, uh, Dr. Salvador actually is our first fellow, uh, but um, during the time, on his fellowship years, uh, sorry for the fellowship months, uh, COVID-19 struck, that's why he became one of the, uh, 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 I would say he became our fellow for hyperbaric and COVID other than seeing difficult wounds, diving accidents, trauma and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, thank you again for the chance and uh, thank you Dr. Oi for uh, supporting us in this endeavor. Thank you all, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. Uh, see, Dr. Bendik, just a few words. Or we go directly to the question. Uh, Dr. Bendik, yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much and good evening. And uh, I think uh, this, is, this endeavor is actually symbiotic. We cannot actually achieve this without the uh, help of our colleagues, especially Dr. Romulo Ui. He's one among the pulmonologists who is really into this uh, endeavor. That's why uh, we could not actually achieve this without the help of our dear pulmonologists. And I would like to thank everyone and, uh, the, and uh, the officers of uh, the PCP and of course the pulmon specialists in the Philippines. We are equally honored. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you, Benedict. PCCP Benedict, mga pulmo ito. So this is also in conjunction with the, the infectious disease section and the pulmonary section of the Southern Philippines Medical Center. So without much ado, my first, there's a first question from uh, Dr. Jubert. Just curious, what was the consent rate? How many patients deemed eligible actually participated? Can you answer that, Arthur? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, for, for this one, sir, since um, this is a compassionate use, this is still in a compassionate use. So basically, uh, we would go for total enumeration at this time, sir, since uh, be, we, we do not know so much yet. So we would like to have as much patient as we can so that we can actually generate more um, um, data and at the same time um, analyze it and maybe in the near future generate more uh, uh, knowledge or, or facts about it, sir. So right now we only have uh, we we have only treated thirteen patients, sir, because um, uh, due to the challenges in the resources, like uh, the other year, we still uh, safety is an issue. That's why um, we, as much as possible, uh, Doctor Romului would screen the patient before the treatment. No, so we cannot just um, get uh, COVID severe patients without proper evaluation. So we only had thirteen patients. So actually, we bought. Uh, the emergency medicine bought a portable high flow nasal cannula so that we can bring kasi yung hyperbaric uh, oxygen uh, device or the, the machine is like around five minutes away from the ICU. Mabuti kung katabi lang natin yan, we can just transfer the patient immediately. So we have to be very careful. We test the patient 
for 30 minutes before we do the transport in the ambulance then to the to the unit and then of course there's sterilization of the unit before and after the use of the hyperbaric machine so next question on the average how many hyperbaric sessions uh, before hypoxemia resolves dr arthur come, come, come again sir uh choppy, sir sorry po so how many sessions in the on the average diba ilan yung nag ilan yung na you had like three sessions and then you had like more yes like sir sessions in some yes sir yes sir uh, on, on the average po uh, generally we had we had 10 patients who actually responded already who already met the treatment the end treatment criteria at the fifth session so there were unfortunately we had three patients who did not actually um, met our end treatment criteria so we had to add uh, three more sessions now after adding three more sessions those three patients uh, only two of them responded the other one uh, still uh, the ROX index was less than five the PF ratio was less than 200 actually less than 100 pa rin po. and they actually and I think although hindi pa natin totally masasabi if what's the real cause but uh, basically because of the all of these patients had uncontrolled comorbidities po so okay that, po. So that was a question from Dr. Lai so this is a question from Robbie, just a Dr. short follow-up is yes, it a daily session as daily for five sessions or every other day uh, we, we we would recommend a daily five sessions for doctor and that is on the that is uh, based actually on the other uh, we actually based that on the other uh, the previous studies that were already conducted like the one in uh, new york langoon and the one from china wherein they did once a day sessions four five sessions for doctor okay so depende rin sa schedule, no? Schedule. Maganda lang with the uh, emergency medicine, they are always there. Mm -hmm. My patients, yes, they read so patients, Romy and Dr. Arthur, who were already intubated and then uh, wala, treated wala. to hyperbaric. Wala, high flow lang. Wala. High high flow. Flow. Okay. So, so far we have 160 attendees. Wow. Wow, congratulations, kudos. Congratulations. Uh, really nice. a great yeah. new innovation for COVID-19 cases. Okay, this is a very nice question from Joe, from Dr. Almazar. The statistical significant difference in the outcomes are between pre and post hyperbaric. Have we considered the contributory effects of the concomitant usual care or natural course or the recovery from illness, especially with the, with the other drugs used with the patients? No. Arthur. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, sir, that is something that we need to consider too because at the moment, uh, the data is not enough to dist the distinguish the effects of other medications, po, sir. Yeah, so this is also, we, we cannot stay away from the usual care, the remdesivir, the mm -hmm. sometimes hemoperfusion. We were not able to present the data, but uh, later on, of course, uh, in the next few uh, we're planning to revise the protocol and really make it stronger sa, sa, ato, sa methodology. Okay, just here is Dr. Josephine Ramos. Si Jopai, how much did each session cost? Was the cost partly or wholly subsidized by the SPMC? Uh, uh, here in SPMC, po, sir, um, it costs around 3500 per session po. Opo. Uh, but that can be, that is uh, sociable, but sir, so meaning they can ask from Linga, they can ask from the office of the president. And most of our patients of that we catered, actually, po, sir, wala po sila nabayaran kasi po of all the social services. Uh, however, some patients paid kasi po, gusto nila, ayaw po kasi nila ng hassle, sir, so uh, they would just rather pay it kasi naman three times, 3,500 3, times five sessions, I, they can pretty much do it. So it, that's about it, sir. Thank you. Uh, another question from Lai. What's the most common sequelae or complaints during and after the hyperbaric session? Uh, may I share my slide, po, sir? Yeah, uh, go, go ahead. I, I actually have a slide here uh, actually showing the adverse effects of 
uh, hyperbaric treatment po. So uh, basically, these are the expected complications when you do hyperbaric treatment, no? So um, fortunately, for for SPMC, uh, our, in our experience, we did not actually experience this with our patients, and I think we can attribute that to a very sound a uh, screening process and uh, by uh, Dr. Ui, no, with with the residents of internal medicine as well. So we, we are very thankful for that. So. We did not experience any of this among the patients, po. Adriano, uh, uh, this is a question from Dr. Benedicto. Ang hirap nito, Gilbert. Uh, was a comparison made among those who received Enox plus possible Dexa and possible Remdesivir plus hyperbaric versus same patients without hyperbaric? Dr. Uh, actually, sir, yes, sir. Actually, sir, in, in this uh, case series, we did not, we we did not actually uh, look into the comparison. But we actually, we, uh, just as uh, what Dr. Romulu has said, that um, we are actually planning to include this uh, analysis of data and uh, parameters in our uh, future refinement of this study, po, sir. But that is a very good point, sir. We will uh, uh, we will include your uh, input, po, sir. Thank you po, for that one, sir. Thank you again, Arthur. Yeah, ma. It, it, uh, next time we will make our methodology better. So what yes, is of two atmospheric pressures used in your protocol? This is from Dr. Edgar. Sorry, sir. Come again, sir. Na chappy po. What is the basis of two atmospheric pressures used in your protocol? And yes, then how many sessions is needed in the study? How, uh, sorry, sir. How many? How many sessions? Oh, oh. Uh, the basis for the two atmospheres, po. Uh, actually, you can you can already appreciate uh, based on the uh, graduated facts that there was there's already a physiologic effect once you expose uh, tissues at 1.5 atmospheres, no. But then. Um, since the institution that actually did this uh, treatment protocol or compassionate use started with uh, two atmospheres, the one in New York actually started with two atmospheres. So we uh, actually we thought initially that we would go for two atmospheres as well. But then um, since upon our assessment with our oxygen plant in our uh, institution that the, the, the oxygen purity here will not reach 100%. So uh, uh, actually accounting that and including that, we actually went uh, further to 2.4 atmosphere just to actually um, uh, counter that uh, issue. So, but it's still a safe dose, po, sir. And uh, that the frequency of session uh, would be uh, once a day, uh, 90 minutes per session duration, po. Okay, uh, here's another question. Very good question from Dr. Edgar. Is hyperbaric oxygen better implemented early or better on the cytokine storm phase? Indeed, sir, that is a very good question because <laughs> that's what we're aiming. We, we, we would like to, as much as possible, uh, institute this, high, this compassionate treatment while the patient is still in stage 2B. We do not want the page, these patients to, to actually progress or deteriorate to the critical phase, which is stage 3. So hence, um, as you can see that most of our patients, if we go back to the, to the data of the ROX index and the PF ratio, most of them um, had ROX index less than 4.88 and PF ratio of less than 200, meaning to say they're in the moderate uh, ARDS based on the Berlin criteria po. So um, early, early treatment is way, way better po, sir. Thank you. Uh... Are there any more questions? So uh, we've really proven and the problem I think is the safety and the efficacy of the study. So all of the patients were discharged improved. Yes, and uh, there was really improvement in oxygenation. Yes, so, Last question, Ulana. Then we'll have our Closing remarks, Pagulana. I will have Dr. Alain for the closing remarks. 
She's the chairman of the PCC PCME committee. Okay, again, thank you very much for our speaker, Dr. Salvador, and of course, our a team of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, Dr. Uh, Benedict and Dr. Ramos, if I'm not mistaken, and Dr. Uy and Dr. Iris and the whole chapter, Southern Mindanao chapter, for organizing this one-of-a-kind, first-ever, very innovative treatment of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy for severe and uh, critical COVID cases. So indeed, it's a very promising therapy. That's why I think we have more than 160 uh, delegates tonight. So it's for the next chapters to beat this number. Congratulations, kudos, and hats Thank off you. to you all. Thank you. Salama. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh, you picture taking now. Picture taking. Yeah, open your videos. Picture taking. Hello, everyone. Yeah, no. Pag picture taking, bukas lahat ng video nila talaga naman. <laughs>